Welcome to Love Your Family again and again and again and again, the podcast where we focus on parenting with love and clarity. I'm Dr. Marcy, a family culture expert who for over 20 years has been helping parents to create happy and strong families. Marianne, I am so excited to have you on as a guest today because we have had a handful of other conversations in our lives together around your family, around work, around mental health that have just been enlightening to me um, and from what you've shared enlightening to you as well. So I would love to start by you sharing with the listeners about your family. Who are you? What do you look like? What's happening in your little bubble of a home? Thank you for having me, Dr. Marcy. I'm super excited to be here today. We are a small but mighty family of three plus a beautiful dog. I have a son, Carter, who is 12 and in sixth grade. Um, active boy. He loves to play soccer um, and enjoys school enough. He is trying out the saxophone this year. I think it'll be a one year and done kind of thing, but we gave it a go. Um, I have a, my husband lives with us and is an active um, state works from home dad like I do most of the time. And we added in during COVID a beautiful golden retriever who I do miss because she is one of the family and we love our princess. And we enjoy the family just hanging out. And during the summer, our greatest joy is going to the pool and just chilling there. Yes. So Usually the first question I ask after someone describes their family is what do they love to do with their family? Being on a podcast called Love Your Family again and again and again and again. It's a great place to start. And But you already started. You already <laughs> dove into that. And what delights me about your answer is that it's just hanging out, right? It's around the pool, which I can certainly picture, but it's just that downtime together. It's not doing a thing which we often get so focused on what do we do together? And what I heard was that you just like being together, which makes me really excited for your family because that's <laughs> fabulous. Because the more we can be, the more connected we are with each other sometimes. We do. We just like, you know, and the other new one I think is Carter's gotten older. He just loves when we feel safe enough with COVID to go out to a restaurant and explore new things like that. And what's the favorite type of restaurant that you like to all, that you all agree on? Well, lately Carter has been pushing us for sushi, which is fine. I love sushi and he's really been craving that. And then we have a favorite restaurant um, in the Northern Virginia area. He loves Patsy. It's called, and he will move heaven and hell <laughs> to get you there. Is Patsy's a pizza place? No, it's not like Patsy's in New York. Okay. Is, no, because I've been there and love that. <laughs> I was like, I didn't think Patsy's moved to DC. I didn't think they extended that far, but I had to check because it's amazing pizza. It is. It's really good pizza. So what kind of food is your Patsy's? It's American and he likes, well, it's a little, it's eclectic. So he likes jambalaya pasta. Sounds delicious. I'm used to jambalaya with rice. I'm going to have to come down and try it. Yeah, it's very good. Amazing. So you know that I delight in talking about all of the goodness. And we try to focus in these conversations around things that are a little challenging or things that you've been thinking about a lot lately within the context of your family. So I wonder if there's something on your mind for us to center this conversation around. Yeah, I have been thinking. So when I met you, it was the start of COVID. And um, I came to you in a lot of ways through mental health issues and keeping my family together during COVID, not just kind of keeping us sane. Let's put it that way. And so three years on, really, because it's probably been close to three, maybe a little under, I've really been thinking about how my mental health impacts my family and the journey that the last three years has taken me on from 
during the start of COVID in that kind of first year where I really just threw myself into taking care of everyone else, making sure their needs were met to then all of a sudden waking up one day and being like, oh my gosh, totally forgot about me and my care and kind of making that shift over the last year and a half to taking care of me. Yeah. So first I want to say, I think a lot of parents did that, especially a lot of moms in the beginning of COVID. It was, what can we do to make these, this easier for my kids? What can I do to make this easier for my loved ones who I can't do anything else about? So there was, you know, less chores, less expectations, more screen time. I mean, also because we couldn't do anything else, but (laughs) there was a lot of, dare I say, enabling of behaviors because it was the one thing that we could do to help our kids. And so I share that to really normalize that that was the path you took. And I love that you're willing to share it and that at this point you see it. And so let's talk about that, you know, year and a half ish period of time for just a few minutes of what did that feel like to you? What were the goodness, the good pieces of it, but also what were the struggles that came from it? Yeah. Um, and it's kind of funny that you say that. Cause I do think in many ways I look back on some of that a little fondly, right? There's we- definitely some great things, some beautiful moments. Yeah. Out of that hard time. Yeah. And so I think I remember kind of fondly making, because Carter did um, virtual school for almost a year and a half. So when things shut down, he was in third grade and then he remained through fourth grade virtually. And I would make lunch for everyone and not just sandwiches often. It was like a hot lunch. (laughs) And so that took a lot of bandwidth because I worked from home. Um, I would be there as a resource whenever he would have questions at school, though often for Carter, the challenge was not so much questions as keeping him engaged during the day because he was bored. So I would do as much of my work as I could sitting next to him or um, the reason I got my nice mic that's totally detachable from my computer so that when he was on school and I was on calls, I could be moving around to help out. And so I think that kind of time, I look back on kind of fondly being able to be there for him and help him with that and be a presence, right? Mm -hmm. I think that was really kind of unique and not something that I, it was almost like being a home at stay at home mom with not. Yeah. And given that you were previously a full-time working parent, yeah, there wasn't the same amount of time. So it is really a beautiful gift that you got so many hours together that you dare I say, got to know your son better because you were able to see him in all of these different dynamics and how his learning went and what, how he engaged in all of that. It's, I love that you see that as a, as a highlight of the experience. Yeah. Silver lining. Definitely. I think the struggles became keeping that up eventually. Right. And so how do you balance having a full-time job, um, doing everything around the house, and then finding some time for yourself and, and being a full-time mom. Now yes. like everyone was home. Yes. And eventually what I dropped pretty quick was anything for me. There was, you know, maybe a walk, but no working out. Um, that went away. I did not have a meditation practice in place. Um, I didn't, you didn't see your friends regularly, right? So your social network kind of suffered. Um, Anything for me kind of fell apart along with, I think you put it very well at the beginning, the structures and the expectations for our kids. So 
I did a lot more for Carter. And we're working our way through that yet, you know, like getting him back to probably where he should be on that journey. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that piece, the fact that you are working back through that journey, it's not his fault. It's not your fault. It's not bad. It's not that at 12, he should be doing this. There's a new expectation because there was this different amount of time. So now it's thinking, where do you want him to be? And how do we get him there without it being some harsh, jarring, confusing, well, now now let's do it, right? <laughs> You're not kicking a bird out of a nest. It's how do we come back from that? How do you make sure that you are now step-by-step step putting in clear expectations so that he can grow up to be the teen and then the young man that you want yeah. him to be with all of that autonomy and independence and responsibility that got shifted during that time. So keep that being a journey. Yeah. And yeah. it's funny you say that. I think about it. So socially, I think all of a sudden we kind of blossomed. I think fifth grade, he went back and it was kind of a mix, right? Like getting back, but things were still pretty t fairly tight. And then all of a sudden sixth grade now, it's great. We live in walking distance to his elementary. So he goes up after school and meets a group of kids for basketball regularly. And he has a phone so I can stay in touch with him. And I feel very safe. I know who the kids are. It's great. Like, and he's gone. A friend's mom has taken them to Dave and Buster's. And there's this nice social. But I'd love your thoughts on this one. He has homework at night. And he's very competent. We're not having any struggles per se. But for instance, he had a book that they had to read online. And then answer five questions. And they had to do this like every other night, I would say. He wanted me to sit with him, <laughs> skim the book, and then verify his answers. And I think that came out of when he was virtual and I would be around always. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think about it. But now I'm like, man, we're going to have to break that. Because number one, pretty soon, he's probably going to be out of my level of <laughs> learning. <laughs> But I want him to know he can do it. And here's where the capacity versus mental health piece comes in. My guess is he read the passage. He had the answers right. He could have done it all on his own. But he got so used to having you as a partner, having you in community, and, and doing it with the emotional support of you being there. Yeah. And so now it's building up his independence so that he feels really good about himself and says, hey, Ma, look what I did. Maybe ask you to come check it. But so that the independence, if he's going after school, back to his elementary school to hang out with his friends and play basketball, and they're putting on games together without grownups navigating it, he can also sit and do his homework by himself. He just hasn't had to practice that. Yeah. And maybe he doesn't want to. I know. I'd much rather sit with you at my kitchen table and do work side by side, which we've never actually done, but it sounds like a great plan, than do it by myself. But I can do it by myself. And if we don't start teaching our kids, especially kids that are your age, right, this middle school grouping, when they hit high school and that independent teenage thing comes, but they haven't built that independence muscle we're going to see more conflicts because they want it and they're ready for it, but they're not practiced in it. So they also really want you, which is already a conflict with teens, but we want to make sure we're building those muscles for them. So there's less conflict there. The other piece of this is you said before, the one thing that fell off in the beginning of COVID was you taking care of yourself. That's how you found time to do your job that you get paid for along with doing your parenting that is necessary along with all of the house things and everything else that was going on. If you have to sit with your son for every piece of homework he does, what, what are you taking off your plate to do now? AKA, what else could you be doing with that time? And in my head, does that mean that your self-care is still suffering 
Or have you snuck it in somewhere else where you're sneaking it in as opposed to really creating time? I'm probably not really creating the time. It's a sneak in if I can get it. And that's becoming the problem again. It's going, it's a little bit better than it was. Yay. Let's celebrate that. It's better than it was. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) But it's still not that beautiful, like one hour run that my husband gets each evening. It's not, not there yet. So that I can have that then like quality about myself that I'm hoping to have one day. (laughs) Yes. Aren't we all? So I just want to point out the duality. Your son needs and is ready for more independence and for engaging his own autonomy muscle. While you also need more structure and support for yourself so you can be a better mom, a a happier human, all of those things. Mm -hmm. So you creating limits for your son and boundaries around your self-care serves you both, which ultimately serves you all. So what do you think your husband does that makes it possible for him to have an hour run every day? How did he create that? How do you do that? Let's learn. <laughs> he just goes. Like, he's like, I'm going to go work out. Bye-bye. <laughs> and, and I say, I'm like, I've got this covered. You go. Like, it's that combination. Okay. So why can't you just go? Why can't you at some other time say, cool, you're now back from the gym. I'm, I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go meet a friend for coffee or I'm going to, I'm going to go sit quietly in another room. Don't bother me for an hour. Why can't you do that? I, I can't. And I'm working on these things. That's probably my codependence coming through a little bit. Okay. So let's change the question. Why don't you do that? Because if you can, yay, you know that it's possible. Why don't you do it? I think I feel like I still need to be there at every step, right? And so it's that growth for Carter. Like I see him growing. I just need to, and I always feel like in the evening, okay, I need to put Carter's homework and then his schedule and then Jeff, I need to make sure he can go for his run and then I need to make sure dinner's made and I still put myself is the very last thing that happens. Okay. So what I hear is that your son needs support. I think, but maybe I don't. And maybe he does. Let's say you're right. I don't. I think, I think that you could create more independence, but. I know. I agree with you. And I'd be curious if you have suggestions for how to start that with him. Because he can be surprisingly, um, if I was just to say to him one night, you do that, I'll be sitting somewhere else. He, I think he would feel, he's sensitive. He would feel like, what are you doing, mom? I think if I can have a way just to back Get him doing it slow, like not slowly, but small steps. Easy. Yes. So do you have any suggestions for those small steps? Of course I do. But before I give you that small step, I want to point out that you have the amazing benefit of being in a two-parent home. So if Carter really does need support and help, your husband could provide that. And it's true. He does. Let me say this in fairness. He does on math because, man, I have noped out on math already in sixth grade. I'm like, I have no idea. Yeah. You go to your dad and he knows on math to go to Jeff. And to leave me out of it. And you have created a dynamic in the house where Jeff doesn't feel like he needs to be the one to be present for Carter because he knows and Carter knows and you know you're going to be there. So when he's like, hey, I'm going to go to the gym and take care of myself, you go, cool, I've got all of this. Yeah. But I bet that if you said, I need an hour every night too, can we shift this dynamic? Because in order for me to feel good about that, I need to know that you're available to Carter. My guess is he would say, all right, cool. How do, like, when? Just tell me. You can, great, I'm here. But we haven't created that pattern. and. 
I think a lot of moms don't ever think to ask. We just carry it. You're just taking it forward. Yeah. Where you could shift that and your husband would be happy to do it. And so this piece of, but Carter needs someone. Okay. Well, dad can be that person. It doesn't have to be you. You're not a single mom. You have another person rely on him. And now let's also talk about the fact that maybe Carter doesn't need every as much support as you think he does. So both can be true and we can work on one piece at a time. So you feel like you're being a quote unquote good mom by making sure someone is there for him if he needs it. It doesn't have to be you. Dr. Marcy, that is so, I think, I think a lot of us feel like it has to be us, right? Like from an early age, we're just trained that it's us. Right. And that somehow we're failing if we can't do it ourselves. And that's a lie. It is. Because it's, while we haven't talked a lot about your husband, I believe I can make some assumptions based on the conversation we've had so far is that he's a good person. He is. He cares about his son. He cares about you. He's intelligent. He's capable. He knows how to turn the stove off and lock the front door. <laughs> and so it's a lie that we've been told that you have to be the one to take care of your child. When there is another capable, smart, loving person there who is also responsible for that human, you can rely on them. It does not have to be you. And so some of the work is to untangle that truth because it's not true. And yeah. say, right, right. No, I don't. It doesn't have to be me. I don't have to do everything. I can be Wonder Woman and ask for help. Because most parents are. Yeah. Be Wonder Woman and ask for help. Yeah. So while that soaks in, let's talk about how we get Carter to be more independent. I like these dual conversations that we're having right now. When Carter comes and says, hey, can you help me do my homework where he has to read this passage, you sit down, you skim it with him, you answer the questions together. If what is happening right now is you guys, you doing that entire experience side by side together, I get that it'd be really jarring and confusing if you were like, nope, you have independence, go do it yourself. <laughs> Too big a step. So a couple ways to do it. One is to talk to Carter and say, you know, I've been thinking about the way we do your homework. And I think you can do more by yourself. So I want you to read the passage first. And when you're ready to answer the questions, I'm going to come support you as you write them in, but I'm not going to be there in the beginning. Or you say, I'm going to sit with you the whole time, but you're going to do it yourself. So you're not going to read it. You, you can help him be thoughtful about how to create the answer without giving him content mm -hmm. so that he's doing the lifting himself. But have my vote would be to have an intelligent conversation with him about this shift. Now, the other option, if that feels hard or you want to test the waters before you do it, is when he says, mom, come do homework with me. You say, I'm going to go to the bathroom. You pull it up on your computer and get started. I'll be there in a few minutes. <laughs> and you go to the bathroom. And then you come and you see, look, he started. That's awesome. Because it gives you a little bit of that reassurance that he can do it on his own. Right? Or, oh, yeah, I just have something in the oven. I just need to, like, let me pull out the chicken that we're having for dinner and then I'll come. You get started first. It's kind of this casual way for you to realize he can do all of this without me. Or while you're sitting there doing the work, being like, oh, I need to go send one email and I left my phone in the other room. Let me go get it. And you go and you come back. So there's this absence that you are creating without it being an agreed upon absence. But if you're not ready to talk to him about it, that's another option for you. I think talking about it's more, we just got, you've got to get comfortable with these conversations and talking to a preteen is never a lot. You get a lot of grunting at this point. Yeah. Yep. And it's, I like the talking part 
because A, this is the easiest of all of the hard conversations you have to have with your preteen and that you will have to have with your teen. I also like it because it allows you to set up your belief to him that he's capable. It's a moment where you get to say, I know how awesome you are. I see how amazing you do all of these things. I know how good it feels to have me sitting here with you. But our time together is going to be when we're at the pool hanging out. You can do this without me. And I'm not going to just run away on you. I'm still here. But we're going to work towards you doing this yourself and remembering that you can do this yourself because you are a rock star. How cool would that be for him to hear all of that and then be like, okay, I like having you there though, mom. And how good would that feel to you? Yeah. He might not say that. He might just grunt, as you said. (laughs) But we can extrapolate what that grunt means. But it creates a space to help build his identity as someone who is independent and capable and smart and thoughtful and attentive and focused. All of those things that he probably is, but may not see himself as yet or know. And I really like that because if I have that conversation, I tell him like, you know, I'm just not going to help you at first, maybe with your answers. And I can use that time, maybe sit in the dining room and read a book. Mm -hmm. That's even care for me, like having time just to read a book Mm -hmm. or prep dinner. So I'm nearby. I'm not, it's not like I'm fleeing the house and running for the hills. I'm there, but I'm a, I'm more of a resource than a crutch. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Switching that dynamic. Like, Hey, I'm here with a question, not the whole assignment. Yes. It also maybe creates a space for you to say, I've had a really full day today and I haven't had any time to just breathe or just be. So while you're doing your homework, you can come ask me anything you want, but I really need to just sit here and do a quiet meditation. You're welcome to interrupt me, but I'm going to listen to a guided meditation while you're doing your homework. So I'm here with you. And you can ask me if you need help, but I need to take care of me so that he sees that he's not your whole world because he's not and he shouldn't be. But he also starts to see that modeling of self-care of, oh, mom gets to ask for what she needs. Dad asks for what he needs every, every night. He goes for his run. Mom's starting to ask for what she needs. That's super cool because we want him to have a model where all people ask for what they need. Whether it's a mom or a dad, you know, whatever that person looks like so that he doesn't make assumptions about gender roles and identifying what those patterns should look like because what's happening now will be part of what he believes to be true in the future. Yeah. I really like that idea. Yeah. And if we're going to add one more layer to it, because, you know, there's all sorts of reasons to do this. The additional layer is that it helps him see how important self-care is, that it's not just I'm my what what you do as a parent models for your kid what they should do. And so you taking care of him, taking care of dad, taking care of the dog, taking care of work, taking care of the house, taking care of dinner. He gets to see, okay, as a person, I take care of everyone else. And he feels cared for because you take care of him. But what's not being modeled is him taking care of himself because you're not taking care of yourself. So the more you create moments where you say, I'm taking care of me, this is important. He gets the message, not someone else needs to show up to take care of me, which is what's been happening so far, but he gets the message. I get to take care of me. I get to ask for what I need and then make that happen. And that's a huge gift Because don't we want him to grow up to be an adult who gets to ask for what he needs and take care of himself? Yes. I want him to just naturally not have to spend a long time trying to figure out, you know, I never knew about this whole like self-care beyond the bubble bath thing until I hit this age. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, you do need to meditate regularly and you do need to have a nice journaling. And You know, all these things that I'm now opening my eyes to, like that 
having gone through that time where we were stuck in the house was really, but it also let me see like, wow, there's a lot I can be taking care of me through that I never knew about. Yeah. Does he know that you journal? Do you talk Um, to him about it? I think sometimes he might be aware of it. That might be one that sometimes like I'll just work on on the side. I have tried to get him to journal, but bedtime, usually he's just like dead in the water. Yes. It's like, I just want to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. So, because during COVID, we did like a gratitude journal. and Yes. I think I got that idea from you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that too. Um <laughs> It can also be a lot of times, and you just did a beautiful demonstration of it. When you're asked about a tool that you're using yourself, it's, well, have I made my kid do it? Which was not the question, right? So you're journaling, you're finding support for yourself. And then it's, well, I didn't, Carter's not interested in doing that. So he probably doesn't really know. But what I was actually asking, which you didn't know, because it's not the words I used was, do you talk to him about the benefit you experience? from your journaling. Because why do I want to go write words in a thing? I don't care (laughs) because he's a 12 year old boy and has never done it before. And he's just like, what is this? Whereas if you start saying, gosh, last night I journaled before I went to bed and I found that I slept really well. I wonder if that's connected. Uh Or if at dinner, you're like, I was really frustrated after a meeting today. And I sat down with my journal and I wrote some things out and it just got it out of my system. It was awesome. Yeah. Start talking to him about your experiences. And then if you offer him to journal, maybe he'll care. But you get brilliant. Yeah. But mental health tools, self-help tools for our kids, we often do when they're at school or once they're asleep and they never know that you're doing it, especially given everything we've talked about, about how much you show up in beautiful ways to take care of him. He doesn't know all the things you do or miss doing to take care of yourself. So if your meditation practice is in the morning, because I know you mentioned that you've found that as a tool that's helpful for you. If you miss it one day, then at dinner, if you're doing family dinner that night, being like, you know, this morning I didn't meditate and I just felt more anxious all day, if that's true, right? Or I didn't meditate this morning and I just felt like I was missing something all day long. It was weird. I need to make sure to do it tomorrow morning passing comment, but it lets him see the impact. Or I meditated this morning and I had this really hard meeting and I rocked it. It, I was so calm when my client was upset. It was, I was astounded. I was impressed with myself. So he sees the benefits. He sees how it impacts without engaging in the tool himself because maybe he won't do it yet. Yeah. But if he sees you doing it sometimes and you talk to him, or talk about how it makes your life better, which I just think in general, that's a challenge with mental health in our world is we never talk about this stuff. No. But I'm a better person when I meditate. I'm a much better person when I do yoga once a week. Uh (laughs) Even once a week, like it's those baby steps. Yeah. We think that we have to do this every day for a long time. I meditate for 10 minutes a day, some days. I can't even say most days, some days. And it makes me a better person. Yeah. That's what these practices are. And I love that you said before, you know, not the bubble bath (laughs) self-help, which I'll admit, I love a good bubble bath, but there's a lot of things that are less time consuming and can be fit into a day-to-day practice that Mm -hmm. may really serve. So I'm wondering what are some of the self-care practices that you've started to bring in or are playing with? So, um, I like you, I like to try for yoga, you know, once or twice a week, we'll call that a victory. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, um, I like to journal, even if it's not long, I'll just say that it can be short. Um, meditation. Define short. Uh, just a page. Oh, and how long would it take you to write a page? Five minutes. Okay. So self-care can be a five minute activity when you need it. Oh, yes. if just, just getting clarity on that. Yes. No, it can just be really short. And then this one's probably, you know, not for everyone. I have started exploring my chakras. 
and Ooh. I have been enjoying it and started this week, a seven day shocker kind of where every day of the week you take a different one and you kind of focus on it through different practices. And what I found is it's all about just the wholeness of it all. So right. One day you're just focusing on grounding yourself. So spending a little time on making sure that you've got everything lined up for the week, your bills, your any tasks. And then the next day was about spontaneous joy, incorporating it. And so really it's just about making sure that you're well-rounded, I think is the key. Yes. I love this. And I, I love the, A, the way you framed the fact that you're working on your chakras and B, the fact that you're talking about it. Because in the world of mental health and in the world of self-care, there are things that may seem silly or weird or woo-woo or out there to other people or even to you. And you're like, that seems strange. Okay, let me try it. And if you find something that works for you, that feels good for you, then follow it. And that's really why we all get to have our own self-care journey because we have to explore what's right for us. And so, yeah, share the, the thing that someone else might think isn't for them. Because today it might not be, but if you keep talking about it and, and the way you just described it of spontaneous joy, who is, who's that not for? <laughs> Making sure your tasks are all ready, who is that not for? So whatever the path is, it's beautiful. We get to write our own. We do. And it's just fun, you know? And I will say I'm not naturally one for spontaneous joy. It does not come easily. I'm not a spontaneous person. Ask my poor husband. He tries. (laughs) And I'm like, but we didn't plan that out in like weeks in advance. And But it's learning to embrace that part of myself and welcome it. Maybe that's why he goes for a run every day and you need to start planning your self-care because he spontaneously feels it's time to go work out. And he's like, I'm going for a run and y'all are good with it. Yeah. But that you think you have to plan it as opposed to spontaneously do self-care. You are probably exactly right. He's so much better at that side of life than I am. Yeah. So you'll practice. You'll get better. Yeah. And the awareness goes so far. Okay. So I know that we could talk on and on about <laughs> self-care and mental health and how to get your son to be more independent. But we're going to bring this to a conclusion with this one question, which is of all the things we talked about, what is the one thing that you're going to make sure you put in place? The one small step that is your takeaway? Oh, I think the homework one we're going to try really soon. Like this yeah. week is soon. Well, the, we're about to head into spring break, so they haven't been giving much homework. Mm. But the first time we're going to get him going in that direction with the independence. Yes. Love that. Love that. Okay. I'm excited to hear how it goes. So make sure you update me. I will. And thank you so much for being here. This has been so fun. A little bit of spontaneous joy mixed in. Um, But also some really good thoughts came through. So thank you for your openness and transparency and honesty and sharing. Thank you. I just enjoy talking with you in the realness that comes through. Absolutely. Life's too short to not be. So thank you. You are welcome. And thank you for listening. I know your time is precious and limited. I'm grateful that you shared it with us today. What's your one takeaway? Just one small step can make a big difference. Make sure you know when new episodes come out by subscribing here and joining my mailing list at drmarcy.com backslash podcast. Do you want to be a guest on a future episode of Love Your Family again and again and again and again? Then go to drmarcy.com backslash podcast guest and let me know. Finally, do you need individualized help for your family? Then go to drmarcy.com backslash contact and connect with my team to learn how we can help you. Remember, blue skies are ahead and we're going to get there together.